Good afternoon, everybody. I am John Krasansky. I'm a principal with HW and Company. We are a dynamic business advisory and CPA firm, and we have offices, three offices in Northeast Ohio, in uh, Beechwood, Menor, Middleburg Heights, as well as an office in Columbus. I am based out of our Beechwood office, but I'm actually coming to you live this afternoon from Aurora, Ohio, where I live, still working remotely off and on. And uh, that's not to be confused with Aurora, Colorado, or Aurora, Illinois, from Wayne's World. And this may not be party time, but I assure you this will be excellent for those of you that remember Wayne's World. Um, but what, we're here today um, in conjunction with Team NEO to discuss the state of manufacturing in Northeast Ohio 2021. So I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules. Hopefully you've had a chance to uh, grab lunch and you know we'll make sure to uh, keep you awake for the next 90 minutes as, as we have a pretty good agenda put together for today. Um, a lot of information to cover, so I won't belabor that. But just to talk a little bit more about our manufacturing advisory group within HW and company, we have a group of individuals that regularly work with manufacturers. And I'm co-lead along with Cheryl Lanise, who will also be presenting today. And we provide business consulting uh, to manufacturers relative to cost analysis, internal control reviews, tax planning and strategies, as well as your um, typical CPA services on the accounting and insurance side. We also offer business valuation, um, fraud forensic and litigation support to our manufacturing clients. And some of the ways that we you know, stay on top of things is being a member of various organizations, including Manufacturing CPAs, which is actually a national network of accounting firms that provide services to manufacturers. So from that, we're able to benefit our clients since we routinely network with accounting firms throughout the United States, and therefore we can bring a national perspective on issues to our local clients. And then locally, we're a member of Manufacturing Works, and they're focused on supporting manufacturers in, in Greater Cleveland and Northeast Ohio. On the screen right now is uh, the presenters, so you can put some faces with the names today. And as we, we're gonna go through the presentation, there's also handouts that are in your control panel. So within there, um, you'll have a PDF of the presentation. There's some additional information about us, and um, we'll talk about some of that too as we continue on through the, the presentation. Um, Phyllis, if you could switch to the agenda, thank you. So just to kind of go through our agenda, this is um, you know, what we want to cover with you today. Jacob Doritsky, who's the VP of Strategy and Research at Team NEO, um, he's going to talk about the research overview. We, Team NEO provided us with research um, relative to manufacturing and the impact of COVID and kind of looking at the, uh, the past, present, and future. And so Jacob is going to touch on that on a more higher level. And then we're going to go through some specific areas of the research um, relative. I'll be covering the manufacturing productivity. And then Kim um, Zagar, who is our uh, Director of Entrepreneurial Services, she'll be touching on the impact of COVID-19 on employment. And then Cheryl Lanise will touch on the employment outlook, you know, after in manufacturing, not only taking into account COVID-19, but just the manufacturing environment in general. And then we'll tie everything together with the technology piece where Kim will come back on and discuss a little bit about Industry 4.0. And then we have a life, real life example with Michael Dellis from Fastener Tool, who's gonna to look at a case study of how they're utilizing technology within their business. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, get into the, the meat and potatoes of everything. But um, for those of you that want CPE or need CPE, there are um, CPA, CPE requirements. It's 1.8 hours of uh, specialized knowledge. And so you'll see polling questions that'll pop up about once every 15 minutes. And so you wanna make sure to answer those polling questions to get credit. And, and just a reminder, you need to be out of full screen mode because oftentimes you can see the question if you're in full screen mode, but you're not gonna be able to answer the question. And then um, speaking of questions, if anybody has questions during this presentation, feel free to put them in the, uh, the chat box. If we have time at the end, we'll go through questions. We have a pretty full agenda, so I'm not sure we'll get to that point, but at a minimum, we will follow up with everyone individually that has posted a question that wasn't addressed um, during this presentation. And be sure to follow us on www.hwco.com. We've got a COVID-19 resource center there. You can also sign up um, to receive emails from us on a variety of different topics. And be sure to follow us on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you have to drop off for whatever reason, you can go back and um, you know, catch up on it and watch the rest of it. 
or if you really like what you hear today and you want to share it with someone, you can point them in that direction. Um, but to get the CPE, it's only you can only answer the questions during this live session today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jacob, the VP of Strategy and Research at Team Neo, is going to touch on the research in general. So, Jacob, you have the floor. John, thanks so much. Really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really appreciate a little time with our partners from HWM Company to share with you some of the trends we're seeing in manufacturing and how we think now headed into 2021. The overall economy, but manufacturing specifically, uh, might be impacted in, in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so look forward to chatting with you for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, Phyllis, if you can hit the next slide for me. Uh, before we dig into the data, uh, just wanted to give folks here who might not be familiar with our organization an overview of what we do. Team NEO is a regional economic development group. We represent 18 counties in Northeast Ohio. Think about the primary markets of Cleveland, Akron, Canton, Youngstown. There are 4 million people, 2 million workers, almost a $250 billion economy. Makes us collectively about the 15th largest economic unit in the country. Um, and we really are concerned with helping companies in Northeast Ohio grow. How do we help create jobs? How do we drive strategies to make Northeast Ohio's economy more competitive? Uh, I won't hit each of them in detail, but if you see those five bubbles there, uh, the things we're really focused on doing, strengthening a better network. There are a lot of economic development, workforce development practitioners. How do we bring that together in a coordinated way? How do we think about advancing technology adoption? We'll get into some of that today as it relates to Industry 4.0. How do we address the talent supply demand gap? Absolutely, manufacturing talent is one of the key shortages we see in the region. So that's even more impactful to what we're trying to do. How do we grow a pipeline of competitive sites? Again, back to manufacturing. How do we think about that industrial inventory of properties that we have? And then how do we take all that we're doing as a region, as communities, and really promote that throughout the country, throughout the world, to help shine light on Northeast Ohio and the assets we have there? So at a high level, um, that's what we do day to day. And my role in that is trying to develop good strategies that are informed by research that help us go out and be more effective in calling on companies. You get the next slide for me. So today uh, we're going to talk about the COVID-19 impact on manufacturing. Uh, you'll see a brief overview of the things I'm going to cover. One, just to give you some historical perspective really quickly, 50 years of Northeast Ohio manufacturing in three or four charts. Uh, second, the impact of COVID-19 on Northeast Ohio in 2020 and 21. And then sort of early on what we're seeing very broadly speaking as some of the winners and losers coming out of the pandemic in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, you can advance to the next slide. Some assumptions underlying the analysis. I don't wanna to dig too deep into this. You can go back and read it. The reality is this research comes from data provided by Moody's Analytics. Moody's Analytics is a globally recognized firm who produces county level data that we then extrapolate for Northeast Ohio to see what's going on in the trends. A lot of the good government data that comes out in the economy takes six to nine months to be released. So this is our earliest projection on what could be happening in 2021. Obviously a lot of year left, so these are all subject to change. Uh, and I would just remind folks, not that they need reminded, um, this does remain a recession driven through a pandemic, right? And until we start to deal with the underlying roots of that, there is only so much that policy and other things can do in the short term. But with all that said, uh, we can dig into the sort of brief historical overview of manufacturing. If you hit the next slide for me, uh, one more. Thanks so much, Phyllis. Um, you can see a couple of trends that have happened since 1970 and even going out to 2030, which are really three things. You'll see employment, the orange bar or line, excuse me, has really declined significantly by more than 50% since 1970. And I think that tends to drive a lot of the narrative. Wages at the same time, the darker line there, have been relatively flat, a bit of growth, but overall in green GDP, we've seen significant GDP growth in manufacturing over that same period of time. And when you think about those three, employment, wages, and GDP, which tend to make up sort of the core of what we think about in the economy, what it really leads you to is the next slide, which is productivity in manufacturing. And change in productivity in manufacturing has grown over 150% since the mid to late 70s. Um, it's a tremendous story that we continue to tell as people sort of have hung on to the Rust Belt narrative and thought about manufacturing through maybe a less than glamorous lens. The reality is we continue to make products here. Manufacturing represents more than 20% of everything we do directly. And when you talk about the economy, 
that serve because of manufacturing, those supply chain jobs, those service sector jobs associated with it. Manufacturing still to this day makes up 40 to 50% of everything we do in Northeast Ohio directly and indirectly. Yes, we're doing it with less people, but we're doing it as productive as we ever have. When we think about the things we manufacture and how we do it with folks, uh, the next slide gives you kind of that long-term view of how it's changed, frankly. Uh, if you look at the black bars in 1970 and the orange bars in 2020, we've diversified the things we produce a great deal over that period of time. Toward the bottom of this chart, if you look back to 70, you see primary metals, fabricated metals, transportation equipment, which is auto, machinery. All of those still matter here, but we've seen significant diversification into other sectors of the economy as well. Chemical matters more today than it did. Food matters more today. Computer and electronic products, plastics and rubbers. So we're doing it with less people, but as we talked about, the story really is productivity, which is driven by increases in GDP. So you see the declines here, but here's what you see growth in a lot of sectors throughout Northeast Ohio's GDP by manufacturing. So again, toward the bottom, you see your primary metals and your fabricated metals. Yes, we do less of that directly today, but chemicals, this has net gains. Food manufacturing has net gains. Even things like petroleum and coal products have net increases in the overall economy. So to reiterate, manufacturing has not died. The Rust Belt moniker does not apply in many instances because manufacturing still truly matters to what we do here. And frankly, it's gonna matter as much as it ever has looking out over the next five to 10 years. With that, we can get into a bit of what's been happening relative to the impact of COVID-19 on Northeast Ohio. Uh, this is a projected change in employment look at the economy overall. You'll see Northeast Ohio in orange, the US in black. What this shows is from 2019 into 2020, we saw a loss of about 9% of our total employment base. That's not just manufacturing, that's all sectors of the economy. Uh, projected to gain a little bit back in 21, somewhere in the half to 1% range, but a real employment recovery not projected to start taking place till 2022. One of the challenges that you see in this slide, if you've looked historically over the past couple of decades, is you see the US hasn't declined quite as much as us. They're down about 6%. Unfortunately, Given some of the diversification issues we've had as an economy, what we saw in the Owen Industrial Recession and the Great Recession we're seeing again today, which is that we get hit a little harder over the past couple of decades than the country as a whole. And because of some of our population dynamics, not growing population as quickly, aging workforce, we tend to be slower coming out of it. So total employment gains even headed out to 2025 right now projected to be still about two to 3% below where we went into the pandemic. If you take a sector look at this, in the next chart, you can see as it relates to manufacturing employment declines through 2020, unfortunately, uh, really no sector was immune to the impacts of what the pandemic did. Um, all sectors did see some declines that went from things like fabricated metal, primary metal, electrical and equipment components from you know, the four to 8% range to much smaller declines in sectors like food manufacturing, for instance, and certain sectors of machinery manufacturing. And this wasn't necessarily uniform. As we'll see when we talk winners and losers, there are sectors that have seen gains in manufacturing, but it hasn't been across the board. And the net decline is what we see here. Uh, next, we'll take a quick look at what we see from a jobs perspective throughout the entire economy heading into 2021. Um, and you can see it's a slightly better story, not the story we want to tell, but about half the economy, those bars to the left, seeing some decline still, oil and gas, real estate, education, and the other half on the bottom right, uh, showing net increases projected in 21. So management of companies, finance, healthcare, professional services, all projected to see somewhere in the 1% to 3% growth range. Manufacturing right now, almost at a net wash, at maybe a half percent loss in 2021 but more to be seen on that. If we take a deeper look at manufacturing, you can start to see where some of the sectors are gonna be impacted most. Um, one of the bright spots should be transportation equipment as demand returns for some of those products, uh, but other areas of the economy, metals, I would call them heavily embedded demand side, um, durable goods, still projected to see um, some relatively small losses in the two to 3% manufacturing range. In part, I should add, because some of these sectors are still, quite frankly, struggling to fill the jobs that were lost through the pandemic, uh, and in many cases, jobs that have been lost over the last five to 10 years. Um, continuing on sort of our journey of the pandemic, we'll take a look at GDP. GDP is obviously hugely important. 
What we're looking at here is Northeast Ohio's share of U.S. gross domestic product when we talk about GDP. A slightly better story through the pandemic. One, we perform more like the U.S. as a whole. Saw declines of about 5%. But looking at 2021 to recover just about all of that GDP back with a full recovery happening toward 2022. This is what we started with from a long-term perspective. This is the story of productivity. Declines in employment offset by lower declines and quicker gains in GDP, driving productivity through things like automation and innovation and others. Um, we'll take a sector-based look at GDP, just like we did from an employment perspective. And you'll see most sectors of manufacturing, just like employment in 2020, got hit. That is not to say that no sector saw success, but again, a very similar story. Um, you have your pandemic-related shortages, and then you have your demand-based shortages. A lot of what we saw happening in 2020 was lack of demand for things like uh, aerospace, automotive, transportation assets, and the embedded supply chains in those. As we look toward 2021, and it relates to GDP, a much brighter story relative to the employment picture, right? Um, so we're seeing all but two to three sectors of the economy with projected net gains in GDP heading into this year. The ones that are projected to lose are really those sectors that are most reliant on people, arts, entertainment, bars, restaurants, uh, and then factors that are in many ways global beyond our control like oil and gas. But seeing healthcare, finance, manufacturing, all recovering, hopefully with significant bounces in the four to 6% range as we head forward. And if you look at manufacturing GDP, uh, similar story. Um, we saw employment, which is still uh, gonna see some losses, Manufacturing GDP in all but a handful of sectors now projected to see gains anywhere from the 2 to 8% range by sector. So an encouraging story uh, and one that starts to become the silver lining for manufacturing and what's happened through this recession as we go forward. Um, if you hit the next slide for me, we'll talk about those winners and losers very briefly. And this is something that we've seen through the lens of the project work we do. You know, from a winner's perspective, Anything from a manufacturing perspective, those manufacturers that could convert to pr uh, providing personal protection equipment for first responders, first line workers, um, have done relatively well if they could convert their products. We've seen actually significant growth in some companies here in the region. Uh, food and beverage manufacturing, particularly as it relates to prepackaged food and beverage, and then IT has also done well. Um, you know, funny enough, things like corrugated fiber or what people tend to think of as cardboard manufacturers have seen growth due in large part to the Amazon economy and the way we're consuming goods these days. And then warehousing, storage, distribution, again, that Amazon economy impact. Uh, losers through the past 12 to 18 months, chemicals have been hit hard in part because of the oil and glass fluctuations globally, uh, heavy metals because of the lack of product demand for some of the embedded supply chains, and then headquarters, oil and gas extraction, um, both of which had been bright spots for the last five to six years, uh, did see some declines in part because uh, some of the headquarters environments, environments had less um, success if you were a smaller company uh, going to a remote work environment, at least through part of 2020. Uh, moving along on this, uh, insights, we covered most of this, so I won't belabor it, but just to remind you, this remains a health crisis and there's only so much you can do to influence macroeconomic conditions in the short term. What we are trying to do though, is think about the opportunity, not to be tone deaf to all of the challenges out there, but how do we think about those talent gaps and how we address those as a region? How do we think about how this leads to supply chain opportunities for new products and new processes? How do we think about companies in good cash positions and M&A opportunities? We're hearing a lot from companies about that right now. And then new market growth, you know, through product disruptions that were maybe coming from Asia or parts of Europe. How do we think about taking those opportunities and scaling those here where it makes sense for high value products? Hit the next slide. Uh, and I believe that was it for me. Uh, so thanks so much for taking a little time to see what we've talked about through a research lens from manufacturing. Uh, and thanks again to our partners at HW and Company. Um, love to be able to share this information with you and really appreciate the partnership. And with that, uh, John, I will pass it back over to you. Thanks again. Okay, and again, I wanna thank um, Jacob and Team Neo um, for all the research that was provided um, to, to help put this section together. And Jacob touched on a lot of different things in his presentation. And so throughout the rest of this, until we get to our case study at, in the end, um, myself, Cheryl, and Kim are gonna kind of expand a little bit on some of the narrative that, that Jacob had. 
Next slide, Phyllis. So this was not the exact slide that um, Jacob had in his section. Jacob's um, section actually had it projecting out then all the way out to 2030. But I think what's important to look at here is you know, despite employment declines, we're seeing increases in manufacturing productivity here in Northeast Ohio. And the one reason that, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I didn't realize that we're still producing as more than, or we're actually producing more than ever with less people. And the reason that is, is because whenever there's job loss, that's usually highlighted in the media. You know, you hear about that more jobs are down, you know, that sort of thing. So really to, better understand well how is this happening how are we producing more with less people that's really what i want to talk with you about today and you know the rust belt narrative as jacob mentioned has driven a lot of the conversation around midwest manufacturing and just to kind of backtrack and talk about the past for a minute and remind everyone what the rust belt was you know in the midwest here we're called the rust belt now but at one point in time it was a booming area um, for manufacturing. And a lot of that came about in the 1800s. You had the Great Lakes here, which was a great way to connect all these various cities and, and to move products on the water to various places. And really that started a big boom in the area. And so economically things were going really well. But what happened was in, by the time you got to about the 1960s and 1970s, you started to see higher unemployment and loss of workers in this area. And that's when it started to become known as the Rust Belt. And really, the Rust Belt's not a swear word. You wouldn't punish your eight-year-old for saying it, but it is derogatory and it does have some negative connotations and realistically was popularized by politicians and in, in some cases, the media. Um, so we're trying to move past that and we're trying to understand, well, why did that happen and how do we avoid that? in the future and really it happened because of a few things number one you had aging factories you had an area where that was robust at one point in time but now those factories are older and in some cases they're 100 years old right and equipment back then was built to last and even now you walk through you know some manufacturers and you're seeing older equipment equipment that was made in world war ii that's still being used today but back then you know some of the equipment even though it was made really well was 100 years old. So also too, the, the businesses that were around here, they saw opportunity elsewhere. The wages were a little bit higher in the Midwest because the area was doing so well. So companies, manufacturing companies were looking to relocate elsewhere down either to foreign countries or even to just the Southern states, which was called the Sun Belt and still is to this day where generally costs at that time and wages were still lower. So that created this whole big economic change in our area. But over time, we've started to rebound and we're rebounding because we're start companies in, in general in this industry are really starting to embrace technology and change. And that's really going to be a big point of discussion as we move through the rest of our slides today. Next slide, Phyllis. So as we're as factories are rebounding, as manufacturing continues to grow here. How are they doing that? And the big measure of that is the productivity, as, as Jacob mentioned, which is really based on GDP. And it's the ratio of the output to input in production. And productivity is actually one of the primary drivers of success in a business. I mean, do you think that without productivity, you could be successful as a business? Maybe sometimes by dumb luck in the beginning, but ultimately you're not gonna survive that way over time. So you really wanna focus on your productivity to be able to be successful as a business. And we've gotten to the point now where we're producing more with less labor. And why is that? And the reason that is, is we've become more efficient right manufacturers have become more efficient and they're doing so by buying new machinery that's uh, more technologically advanced continuing to look at process improvements and really focusing on the people and the people really make a difference and one thing i do want to point out is even though employment has been down and cheryl's going to talk about employment in general and manufacturing even though employment's down the people are still very important because without the people you're still not able to really produce the product that, that you have as a manufacturer. We're utilizing technology and we're utilizing it well to be efficient and to have higher productivity, but it's really still the people that make a difference. And really the best way to look at this is to try to somehow harmonize your efficiency with your productivity. Because if you think about it, the more efficient you can become, 
the higher your productivity will be. And if your productivity is higher and there's a demand for your product, that's gonna ultimately result in higher, higher revenues, higher sales. And once you have those higher revenues, you can continue to reinvest into your business, continuing to get even more advanced technology, maybe growing, maybe you outgrow your space then and you need a second location. And so it really starts though at the ground floor with this productivity and, and with the efficiency, right? So next slide, Phyllis. And you know, one of the things that I touched on with efficiency is really looking at the technology and how to leverage it and become more efficient. And Kim Zagar is going to talk more in detail about some of these items I have on this slide. But just to touch on things on kind of a higher level here, you know, we're seeing a lot of big data and analytics out there. We're looking at analytics today, right? Jacob has provided us with a lot of analyses. If you are in one of the industries that Jacob pointed as a winner or is projected you know to continue to grow you know you want to use that to your advantage you want to be able to try to predict things before they occur and that's really where big data comes into play and then robotics is is very popular and it has been for some time even going all the way back to you know the automotive industry many years ago and the one thing is you know sometimes people cringe when they hear robotics like they don't want to you know, have robots take jobs and, you know, they're, they're afraid to work with robots. They don't really understand it. But the biggest benefit to, to robots and even robotics and even to, to some extent, just artificial intelligence in general is you start to reduce and or eliminate human error, the possibility of human error. And if you think about it, we're all human, right? We all make mistakes. And when there's mistakes that occur in manufacturing, sometimes they can be very costly and you're going to have that. But any way that you can, when you're looking at your risk assessment, if you can eliminate those potential mistakes through technology, you're going to be better off for it. You know, and I always like to think of technology of things in my daily life. I think sometimes, you know, we're afraid or people that have worked a certain way for a certain amount of time are afraid to adopt technology. But meanwhile, you're adapting to new technology every day in your regular, in your life. Um, for example, you know, with cars now, you know, you've got cruise control, but there's also ones that have the, the crash detection. And sometimes they help you. And it doesn't, I'm not talking about, you know, you're texting and driving or anything like that, but sometimes you could get distracted and it's helpful if the car in front of you slams on its brakes to have your car kind of warn you about that. And so I think, you know, you're, someone's already using that technology, shouldn't be afraid to adopt new technology at, at their plant. Also, you know, with everything with the pandemic and having to go to remote working in certain cases, a lot of companies have leveraged technology a lot differently. They were kind of forced in this case. But I think the important thing is, you know, when you're looking at how to better or how to um, improve your processes, you always want to look at technology more in advance rather than potentially being forced into it. We hear a lot about the Internet of Things, which Kim is going to talk about, too. But I think about even in, in my life with the Internet of Things that at home here, my fridge will tie an app and my fridge will tell me when my water filter needs to be changed or air filter or the washer and dryer gives us all these different statistics on it and when we need to refill the uh, detergent in there. And then we've got an app for my wife's car that tells us when the tire pressure is getting low before it actually gets low and kind of warns you when your service is going to be due. And so there's all these things that are interconnected. And again, we're seeing, you see a lot of that too in, in manufacturing as well. And you shouldn't be afraid to have things talk to each other because it really can help streamline a lot of the processes. And lastly, on the 3D printing, you know, the question is kind of out there is, you know, can you trim your supply chain as a result of 3D printing? And supply chain became very popular or lack thereof in certain cases in 2020 with the pandemic. So there's ways to think about going forward. You know, if you're not even that familiar with 3D, print, 3D printing, is there anything there that could really help us in what we do and provide us with potentially some, some materials that maybe then we can kind of trim down our supply chain a little bit? Next slide, Phyllis. So just to kind of touch on the what are we seeing um, relative to productivity and, and technology leading into it, I just wanted to talk about a decision tree example of, you know, having older machinery on your plant floor versus investing in new machinery. And I think oftentimes a business and a business that has been around for a while and is using older machinery and, and has it, its success will sit there and say, well, we don't want to fix what's not broken. This is what got us here. 
Um, but the reality is technology is moving faster than ever and advancements in technology are moving faster than ever. And so it's getting to the point where if you don't invest in new technology, there is going to be a point where you're just not going to be able to keep up or it's going to be so costly to catch up that you're just going to be too far behind. And realistically, it's as new software is out there and, and companies are switching to different software products, it's harder to really... Uh, interface your old machines with this new software with new systems that you're putting in place and if a machine breaks it's harder to get replacement parts depending on, on how old the machine is so really you want everybody to think about their own business and think you know is the equipment that i'm using is it becoming a potential liability to me um, how many of my machines are probably past their prime but we still use them because the longer you wait to actually make any decisions on that, you know, you, you could end up jeopardizing your operations or, or actually end up having downtime, which would be the worst thing, because obviously that kind of takes efficiency and productivity out the window. So I think with the, and then with the factory of the future, oh, can you go back um, one more? I just want to talk about the factory of the future to, to close out my section before the polling question. but. You know, everyone has their own idea of what the factory of the future uh, will look like. As more and more technology comes out, there's differing views on, you know, will people still play a part in this or not? Um, one of my favorite quotes was from Warren G. Bennis years ago, where he says, the factory of the future will have two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog and the dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment. So his view is that machines are gonna take over and you really just need one person there and the dog to remind them not to touch the equipment, meaning you really don't need anybody there. Um, but the reality is there are, there are views that, you know, there are fields out there where machines aren't gonna be able to surpass people. You know, what, what artificial intelligence and technology though should do is, it should help us remove a lot of the repetitive and boring work, which is really where a lot of the mistakes are made. So I like to look at it that way, where I think technology can help us. And I think too, as we invest in people, and Cheryl's gonna talk on that a little bit, that's really the key of it too, because if you have people working with artificial intelligence, I think you get to an optimal point with your productivity there. And equipment itself depreciates over time, but really people, as they grow, they're actually an asset. They actually appreciate, our knowledge appreciates every day. So we should be in, investing in, in people as much as we can to work with the technology that's there. So that's how I envision the factory of the future. Um, so continue kind of segueing from my uh, people discussion at the end of my section, Kim is going to come on now and talk about the uh, COVID-19 projected impact on manufacturer employment. So the floor is yours, Kim. Thanks, John. Um, so I saw an interesting quote recently, and it talked about COVID-19 being the great accelerant, forcing dramatic changes across just about every segment of our economy and society some being temporary, some being permanent. And I think that kind of encompasses what probably all of us are seeing and all of us are feeling, um, regardless of whether you're in manufacturing or any other aspect of society. Um, but I think everybody will agree that some impact of your life or your business has been impacted in some way. So next slide, Phyllis. Looking at the numbers, if you look at this, Ohio had added 11,500 manufacturing jobs from 2017 to 2020. Then COVID hit and we had a decrease of almost 100,000 jo manufacturing jobs in just a matter of a few months. Um, this was a combination of a few factors, right sizing of a workforce, and that's just when companies were looking at their ability to financially sustain COVID and all of that uncertainty tied with it. Um, decreased demands for obviously a variety of reasons, whether it was consumer demand or just supply chain issues, and obviously the business closures and limitations. Um, by August of 2020, we had regained almost 60,000 of those jobs, but it continues to go up and down a little bit. Next slide. So if you look at this, Team NEO did this research. Jacob presented this a little bit earlier, and you can see some areas were hit harder than others. Um, we'll see on the next slide some of the reasons, but if you look, printing and related support you know, was one of our biggest hits non-metallic mineral products, furniture and related product manufacturing, and then fabricated and primary metal manufacturing were kind of some of the hardest hit subsectors. Um, next slide. So again, Team NEO presented this a little bit earlier and looks at some of the reasons. You know, obviously PPE gear, if somebody was contributing to that, whether they were um, in the supply chain for some of those things, it's not just the actual gear itself, 
but a lot of companies were able to adapt to provide some of the testing and diagnostic supplies. Um, obviously the food and beverage, a lot of restaurants were even able to adapt to going to more of a carry out and delivery service um, in addition to grocery stores. Obviously IT is a big thing with all of the remote workforce and just less people being in facilities and then warehouse and storage distribution network. And then, as Jacob mentioned, the paper and corrugated fiber manufacturers, I thought that was interesting because that was one of the areas that I didn't consider as an essential worker. But um, I had a friend that was in, they actually produced the barcodes, their company, the labels for things. And you wouldn't have considered that to be an essential part of the supply chain until you realize that none of this stuff can go out without its labels and barcodes, which takes care of the whole supply chain and monitoring everything. So there was kind of, I think we all saw some interesting companies that were considered essential workers and we realized what we could and could not live without. Um, and then obviously on the loser side, which you know nobody likes to spend a bunch of time on, you know, chemical manufacturing, um, you know, the metals production. And it's funny because I looked at that at first and said, well, why was metal so far down? You know, they wouldn't have been affected by COVID, but then it didn't dawn on me that that's the demand for, you know, things that heavily use those products, which would be like the automobile industry and the aerospace industry. Um, and then obviously the chemical manufacturing was just a demand shortage. And then, you know, oil and gas and headquarters. Um, next slide. So when we look at what the projected employment recovery is, you look at this slide and the second line there is Northeast Ohio. So you see it lags a little bit behind the rest of the US and it es it's estimated that it could take until 2025 for manufacturing employment in Northeast Ohio to recover. But as you're gonna see, the numbers don't tell the whole story from the employment side because of the fact, as Jacob mentioned, and I think John highlighted a little bit, we're still doing more with less people. So just a decline in employment doesn't drive the whole recovery because we are doing more with less. And as you'll see later on, you know, automation is gonna play a huge part here. So there is opportunity to make up some of those jobs elsewhere. Next slide. So this next slide from Team NEO shows the projected change in total employment in Northeast Ohio. And you're gonna see here, manufacturing kind of falls somewhere in the middle of that. The, obviously the biggest winners are gonna be, you know, the IT services and professional services. Um, healthcare obviously is a big winner. Retail has been one of the more adaptive industries where even while consumer demand might've been a little bit less, they were able to adapt to a remote workforce as well as in some cases, you know, remote buying by consumers. But at the end of the day, you're gonna see the recovery is gonna be dependent on several factors, which we'll see on the next slide. You'll see here kind of the biggest factors, and it's probably nothing that's earth shattering to anybody. The companies that were able to adapt to remote workforce and having a de decreased employee capacity, um, companies that were able to overcome the productivity decline due to COVID restrictions in their workplace, and some workplaces are gonna see that more than others, depending on if your productivity is dependent upon you know, a body count in a small area. Those companies had to switch to either lower production or split shifts and get their workforce to adapt. You had employee absentee issues, whether it was sickness of the employees themselves, family members, just quarantine and safety concerns. Um, difficulties in rehiring and finding new workers has been an issue for some. Obviously the added costs, at one time, you know, it was mentioned, oh, these are extraordinary expenses, I think, but now everybody's finding that these are ongoing costs and it probably will never go back to exactly what it is with this highlight on safety procedures overall. Supply chain issues kind of speak for themselves and then obviously lower demand in certain subsectors. So what factors mitigate the, a company's ability to adapt and overcome this? Obviously there's some luck involved. If you happen to be in an industry that was kind of um, not affected by supply chain issues or consumer demand decline, you know, you fared a little bit better as we saw in some of the other slides. But what we also were able to see in all of this is that some companies, even if they were in kind of the unlucky subsector, were able to adapt. Um, GM and Ford, if you look at them, they were able to change their production over and start manufacturing ventilators to, and that accounted, you know, allowed them to keep people employed, but it also allowed them to, you know, keep a revenue cycle going when the decline for cars dropped. Um, I read a story about how GM, in a matter of four days, was able to produce a 3D prototype with 3D printing to supply 50,000 face masks per day, the face shields that the 
front end workers were using. So I thought that was pretty cool and a good example of a company that was able to adapt quickly. Um, there's other examples of Boeing, for example, and some other manufacturers where they were you know, creating surgical gowns. I mentioned the diagnostic equipment. Um, a company was able to produce 3D nasal swabs and test kits, all, all things these companies didn't do before, but they had 3D printing ability and they were able to adapt and innovate to change with the market. Um, and then again, financial stability to sustain the downturn. You'll see um, PPP funding and the CARES Act tried to assist with some of that and allowed some employers to keep their workforce employed to get through this. And then obviously workforce them issues themselves, whether it was, again, I mentioned sickness, whether it was you know employee absenteeism, or just trying to figure out how to keep your employees safe in the workplace or feel safe with everything else going on. On. I mean, if you think of you know a typical manufacturing plant, if you have people on a line working close together, you know if somebody gets exposed to COVID, that could shut down your whole shift. So there was all these issues that companies had to deal with that they didn't before. Um, and one of the interesting things that's coming out now as we look at this employment change is going to be the vaccine and whether or not companies mandate that for employees to return and how you address those situations. So there's still some challenges to come. But I think what we all learned from all of this is that the companies that were had the ability to adapt are the ones that are faring the, faring the best. And one of the things that I think we've all learned from COVID is that many systems and people were not prepared for the te technological revolution of re remote working, telehealth, teleeducation, and on the manufacturing side for telemaking, buying, selling, you know, service and delivery. So I think it, COVID, when I talked in the beginning about it being the great accelerant, it, it also opened our eyes to a lot of areas where we had some weaknesses and also opportunities. And I think the companies and the manufacturers that are faring the best are the ones that had the ability to be flexible, adapt, and innovate. And as we're going to hear a little bit later on, technology is going to play a huge role in all of that. We have the technology ability, but it's going to be a matter of who collectively commits to making it happen and executes on those things. And again, we'll hear some more about that later. And then the final thing is, you know, we hear about the employment decline as a result of COVID. And the biggest question that I had when I, had, when I was looking through all this is, why didn't the COVID layoffs solve the worker shortage issue? And Cheryl's going to talk a little bit more about that. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be speaking about um, just the manufacturing labor outlook. So, you know, the research is showing us that we're going to, you know, really need a, a quite a few people, uh, quite a few replacement workers coming in the near uh, next few years. I'm going to be talking about some of the hurdles manufacturers are facing and what they're really going to need to do to overcome, you know, this labor shortage. Uh, Phyllis, next slide. So, you know, first let's take a look at, you know, kind of the numbers. And again, I'm a CPA, we got to look at numbers, right? So with uh, we roughly in Ohio, we have over 700,000 workers that are employed in manufacturing. Ohio happens to be uh, home to the third largest manufacturing workforce in the U.S. So we're behind California's number one, Texas is number two. Uh, the manufacturing sector, we have about $43 billion in payroll. So this is the highest total amount of wages paid in Ohio for any industry sector. So that includes government and healthcare. So now, now we kind of got these numbers out of the way. Let's kind of take a look at what the, you know, the labor shortage, what the causes are, and then what others are going to be doing to tackle that problem. Okay, Phyllis, next one. All right. So when we look at the national projections for the manufacturing labor shortage, you know, it's estimated that you know over the next decade or so, nearly three and a half million jobs will be needed, but two million of those are going to be unfulfilled. So, you know, when you, guys, when you think about this, this is roughly 57%. It's more than half of your needed workforce isn't gonna be there. Um, you know, the causes, you know, we know we have retiring baby boomers, you know, for the, for the first time in the US since the late 1940s, you know, 48, 49, those people that are old enough to retire now outnumber those that are entering the workforce. You know, we've got this perception of dirty jobs, you know, but manufacturing, they have the state of the art facilities. They've got these modern shop floors. You know, we, we have this perception though, that there's still this dirty, grungy place that, you know, still exists. Uh, you're gonna have, you know, we have difficulty recruiting young people. You know, they, 
they just have a lack of interest. You know, they uh, we don't have adequate STEM education, I think, in our high schools. And, you know, they, just, they don't see it as a career path. Manufacturers, you've got to do a job. You've got to learn how to sell your company to these young people. Um, you know, one of the biggest hurdles manufacturers face with the labor shortage, you know, it's that mindset of, you know, everyone needs to go to college. So we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and then lastly, we have, you know, a lack of skilled labor. You know, the problem is, I think, is you know, nobody wants to work anymore. You know, they all want that, you know, that corner office job, yet they unintentionally belittle all those jobs, you know, that make the corner office. Next slide. So, you know, when you look at the possibility that in 10 years, you know, about 57% of that needed workforce just isn't going to be there, you know, it begs the question, you know, what do we do now, right? So what you're gonna need to do is prepare for the reality that you may be operating your facility with, you know, just a pared down workforce. This has got to be part of what your long-term operating plan is gonna be. Um, you're gonna need to work on, you know, preserving this domain knowledge. You know, it's it's that knowledge that employees have from years on a job, you know, they, they um, it, it's the stuff, it's, it's all up there in their heads, you know, it's nothing's documented. It's, it's you know, just the experience that's, that they have, that's got to get transferred to the next labor force. You know, we need to work on documenting process settings, maintenance secrets, you know, we got to transfer all that knowledge into future employees. You know, um, you know with a pared down workforce, I mean, you're going to really need to invest in technology. You know, machine learning technologies, they can analyze data from past production runs and and identify the profitable ones from the ones that are least profitable. You know, they can help with identifying stuff like, you know, a drop in temperature or speed, which may be caused a bad run. You know, this is gonna allow employees to spend, you know, less time kind of manually investigating and correcting these problems. You know, with the projected reduced workforce, I mean, you've gotta make it part of your plan that you're just gonna have to invest in technology. So, you know, you really need to start documenting all these processes now. You'll, you'll need to be able to train those new workers, um, you know, so that you're not going back and recreating the wheel. Next slide. So manufacturing, it definitely has an image issue when it comes to, you know, people's perception about working in manufacturing. You know, people, again, they perceive it as this dirty, low paying, unskilled labor. And, you know, the industry really needs to rebrand itself as, you know, it's interesting, it's stable, it's this well-paid career. You know, it's not about just being a job. This is about a career choice, guys. You know, this, this is something that you want to do. You know, we've got to debunk these myths about manufacturing jobs again. You know, these aren't, these aren't dirty jobs. These are jobs that, you know, they're in cool places. You got to, you know, that you're working in. It's, um, it's not like what grandpa used to work in. You know, it's not that dirty, gingy thing anymore. You know, we've got to, you know, get the word out. These are high paying jobs. These are jobs that sustain a middle class family. You know, we, we have the use of robotics and automation. I mean, they demand high skills. You know, you, you can't be an unskilled person trying to, to use robotics and automation. We've got to get this out so that people see this as high skilled and not an unskilled labor force. Um, you know, one of the next things, you know, our next generation's workforce to, to improve them in the US, we have got to expand our STEM education. You know, it's, I don't think it's a secret that the US kind of lags behind other countries in that. You know, what you guys as manufacturers are gonna to need to do is work directly with high schools, trade colleges, universities. You're gonna to have to tell them, you know, what you need, uh, how you need them to educate your, uh, your, their people, your employees, your future employees coming in. You know, what vocational skills are you gonna need those people to have when they graduate? You've got to be really explicit with the skills that you need and what you want in your new hires. Next slide. So, you know, you can't talk about manufacturing labor force without bringing up, you know, Mike Rowe. So he's that dirty jobs guy. You know, this guy, he's got an amazing attitude on life. And, you know, he hosts this TV show called Dirty Jobs. And uh, he's got great insight into what's wrong with today's labor force. So let me just read this quote from Mike real quick. You know, our crumbling infrastructure, our widening skills gap, the disappearance of vocational education, and the stratospheric rise in college tuition. These are not problems. These are symptoms of what we value. And right now, we have to reconnect the average American with the value of a skilled workforce. Only then will the next generation aspire to do the work at hand. So, you know, look at Mike's picture uh, next to the slide, but it, 
you know, he cares because about manufacturing because, you know, he wouldn't have all the stuff he needs. You know, that's how we as a society, we got to think like that. You know, back in our parents' and grandparents' days, this was considered to be a cool job. This was a great career. And now it's just, you know, it's viewed as this lower uh, job in society. You know, there are millions of skilled jobs that are going unfulfilled every year. Yet, you know, college graduate unemployment's at an all-time high. You know, that doesn't even make sense. Now, student loan debt, it's the second highest consumer debt in the U.S. There's like 44 million borrowers who owe like $1.5 trillion. I mean, I can't fathom those numbers. You know, America has convinced ourselves over the past 30 years that college is the answer and everyone should go. As a society, we've just devalued the path, you know, to other non-college career choices. You know, as a result, vocational schools are kind of seen as those that are eh, not cut out for college. You know, this skills gap needs to be closed and the stigmas and the stereotypes associated with manufacturing have got to be challenged. Next slide. So um, a couple months ago, I was listening to a presentation put on by you know, the OMA, um, and you know they had people from different companies that were talking about you know what they were doing to skill up their labor force and you know kind of get more people involved and interested in manufacturing. So there was this one company. It was called um, Aerial Corporation. They're down there in Southern Ohio or Central Ohio, and they're a pretty big company. So what they are, they're in oil and gas. And in their particular company, they, they have a downturn about every five years. So they have a highly skilled labor force, and these people are really, really hard to replace. So what they've decided as a company is they don't lay people off you know, when they have that downturn. Instead, what they're doing is they're training up their workforce. You know, They send these guys to school, they pay them 40 hours, 20 hours to work, 20 hours of school. And you know what this is doing is it's skilling up that labor force. It's keeping the employees busy and engaged. You know, one of the other things they do is they have this thing called a, you know, it's the blue chip program. So what they do here is they recruit people for attitude and aptitude. So um, you don't need to have vocational training. You just have to come in with a good attitude. And they provide like a thousand hours of this intense, you know, hands-on training. And then they hire, you know, and they hire you as an employee. Um, and when you start this program and then once finished, that employee can just go and hit that shop floor running. You don't need to apprentice with anyone, you know, you've got the training you need. So, you know, when you think about it, they're basically training employees, you know, for six months, you know, roughly what, if there's a thousand hours of training, 2,080 hours in a year, so it's like six months. And then they have, a, you know, a skilled worker ready to go. You know, these workers, they're trained the way the company wants them, you know, along with like the skills that the company needs them to have. So, you know, this is just one example of what, you know, a company is doing to help scale up the labor force. Uh, Phyllis, next slide. So um, in Lake County, and I happen to work in Lake County, you know, there, the various chambers of commerce, you know, along with the, the Alliance for Working Together Foundation, they've developed a workforce initiative, you know, what that helps educate Lake County students, you know, about careers in manufacturing. So, you know, one of the things that they do is they have this Think Manufacturing Career Expo. And during the expo, you know, they have, you know, there's tables lined up of all the local manufacturing companies, you know, they're discussing their career opportunities and so on. You know, they have these breakout sessions where the kids can learn interviewing skills. They talk to, you know, a manufacturer about, you know, what's it like to work in manufacturing? Um, they've had um, in years past where, you know, they've kind of done like a breakout room where they have, um, you know, there's equipment in there that the manufacturers bring and then the kids have a chance to kind of try it out and see what it's like. So, you know, this is kind of an example of what we're doing in Lake County to attract high schoolers and to help with that workforce development. But what you, you know, what the real takeaway is, it's about collaboration. You know, you're collaborating with nonprofits, area businesses, schools, you know, the chambers. I mean, it's, it's you're gonna have to collaborate with people in order to get that workforce developed. Next slide. So, you know, I think as parents, we tell our kids, hey, you have to go to college. You know, and kids are told this from the time they leave the womb. I think some kids are told this from the time they're still in the womb. You know, and as a society, we've convinced ourselves that, you know, the true path to happiness is a four year degree and a lot of debt. So, you know, com community colleges, trade schools, apprenticeship programs, you know, these are kind of viewed as you know, that consolation prize if you're just not smart enough to get into college. You know, right now, societies, teachers, guidance counselors, and especially parents, 
You need to stop telling kids that college is the only career path. You know, if you think about it, if you can't convince the parent that there are other career paths other than college, how will you ever convince that child? How will you ever convince that child to come in and get a career into manufacturing? You know, we need to have buy-in from parents. You know, we, we need to involve both parents and, and their kids in career days and with all these manufacturing companies. You gotta show them, you know, what a modern day facility looks like. You know, they need to understand that there's opportunities and that there's a true career path there. You know, don't limit where you look for talent. You know, you don't need brute force. You know, Dwayne Johnson doesn't need to work at your factory. You know, you can get people in there that don't have those big muscles. We have machines and stuff that do all that hard work. You know, it's jobs that were lost in COVID. You know, there's, you look in retail, restaurants, hospitality, you know, there's a lot of people that are out of work. You know, the idea is hopefully trying to find those people and to get them into manufacturing. Uh, next slide. So one of the ways that Ohio is helping employers upskill their workforce is through the TechCred program. So this program may reimburse an employer for up to $2,000 you know, per credential when a current or a prospective employee completes eligible technology-focused credentials. So what happens is the employee can, or I'm sorry, the employer, they get um, a maximum of $30,000 per funding round. And you know, what this is doing is this is you know, upskilling your workforce. Um, you, you gotta keep in mind that when you make the application, you can have prospective employees, you know, in mind of who you're going to, you know, have go through a, a credential. But once you actually, you know, um, apply for reimbursement, everybody's got to be a W-2 employee. Um, you know, the credentials got to be industry recognized, technology focused. It's got to be short term. It's got to be able to be completed in 12 months or, you know, 30 credit hours. And they do base, uh, you know, when they go through and they look at this, they um, put companies into different sizes so that uh, you know, they can award these you know, uh, Ohio tech creds you know, to different companies. Uh, next slide. So if you're going through this, they do uh, score the applications. You know, they're gonna look at you know, what you say the wage increase will be in relation to the credentialed costs. Uh, they're gonna look at you know, the level of economic distress in the region you're in. They're gonna look at how many awards have been made. Uh, they're gonna look at you know, the amount of, that the employer is gonna contribute to the credential. So what's also important to note is this is not on a first come, first serve basis. So you don't have to be the first one to get it in there, but you know, because they're gonna score it and they're, they're gonna look at all of these. Um, you know, right now, the current application period is running. So it's going from January 4th to January 29th. So if you have anything that this could apply to, you, you still have a week to go in there and get your, um, your applications in. And I did include a website there for you to kind of look up and you can apply on that website. You can read up a little bit more on it. Um, you know, so this is just a way for employers to potentially defray the cost of upskilling their labor force. So why is the tech credit important? Well, we'll be kind of discussing the importance of technology in the next session with Kim Zagar. Sorry guys, you have to hear me again. <laughs> uh, this part will be brief because I think everybody's anxiously awaiting our case study. But just a little bit about Industry 4.0 is we've heard throughout this presentation, technology and automation are really, you know, kind of the future of all aspects of our economy, but specifically in the manufacturing area. Um, you know, we do have a labor shortage and one of the biggest ways to solve some of that, obviously we need more skilled labor and we need more people into manufacturing, but we can also become more efficient. You've heard from John and Jacob a little bit too that while we are doing more with less, there's still a lot, a lot of opportunity out there. Um, next slide. So you can see on this research from Team NEO that there's a huge potential impact if companies fully utilize and embrace Industry 4.0. Um, based on the analytics, if we were to adopt our relative share of the industrial Internet of Things, and technologies, we could see manufacturing GDP grow by four to $13 billion or more. That's really um, a huge impact when you think about it, especially given everything that's going on in our economy right now. Um, next slide. So what is Industry 4.0? We hear the term thrown around a lot, but I'm not sure everybody understands the um, history behind it. It's you know the rise of the digital industrial technology 
But since the 1800s, there's been three industrial revolutions, which I'm sure we're all aware of, but maybe haven't put the labels to it. We had the mechanics of the steam engine, then we had the innovation of the assembly line, and then the speed of the computer, which was also known as Industry 3.0. Now Industry 4.0 is taking that Industry 3.0 to the next level and kind of working with the industrial internet of things and connecting everything together and really kind of just moving everything into the next century. Um, one of the biggest things is a lot of people probably have, you know, the smart homes with their light bulbs and everything like that. And, you know, obviously we all take the internet for granted and how everything connects together. You know, there's blockchain technologies and all of this data and analytics out there. But it's really when all of those things work together that you kind of reach the most efficiency possible. That's, you know, connecting everything from, you know, the physical things like machinery, robotics and vehicles to the data and the analytics behind everything. It encompasses the entire supply chain from the smart manufacturing and then the warehousing and the logistics behind all that. Um, it also goes a step further, connecting the backend office systems for your enterprise resource planning. And it, it is giving us visibility and data that we've never had before. Um, years ago when I worked in kind of retail and production, we always used to use the term work smarter, not harder. And I think industry 4.0 really takes that to the nth degree. You use technology to improve your efficiency, safety, quality. Jobs that might have been extremely dangerous for you know, a human to do can now be done possibly by a robot or somehow automated. Um, you can improve quality control because obviously the precision of a robot might be a lot better and not open to human error. And then just obviously the overall efficiency of things. In some cases, you know, we're gonna use technology to do the task. In some cases, we might be using it to monitor progress, measure quality, and then again, there's the data and analytics that we're gonna to use to improve all of that. Um, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the big data and the AI analytics. Um, big data gets collected from a variety of sources. And you know, some, some of you may be using some of this already, but a lot of what we saw with COVID-19 is a lot of places have an opportunity to expand that and really encompass it instead of just using one piece or part of all of this to get it all working together. You know, from your factory equipment that can monitor things and measure to um, the Internet of Things devices, ERP and CRM systems, and then obviously all the various supporting applications. The analytics that are powered by AI, which is the artificial intelligence that's going to learn as it goes, and the machine learning is going to, in real time, allow us insights to improve our decision making and automation at every step of supply chain and productivity. Um, it goes from the planning, the logistics, the manufacturing, you know, research and design and engineering. I mean, you know, 3D printing has really opened up a lot of things. Like I mentioned earlier, 3D printing allowed, you know, GM and Ford to start producing some of these ventilators and these face shields for front end workers an unprecedented time. Um, and then just enterprise asset management and procurement. Um, again, every aspect of the supply chain can be monitored by this in real time. You can fix you know, issues. Um, I think one of the coolest examples for everyday life of everybody is you know, on Amazon, you can get those alerts that say you know, your Amazon package is six steps away and it shows you exactly where it is in every step of the chain. You know when it was shipped, you know when it's on its way, you know when it's a few stops away from your house, and then you even know when it's been delivered. And I think that's just an everyday example that we can all relate to and kind of see it happening. And imagine that used to the nth degree in you know, some of our manufacturing facilities today, what that could do for us. And with that, I, you know, I could talk all day about the productivity and all the different things that we could learn, but I think it'd be more insightful to hear from it from a real life case study in a local company doing that. So with that, I will turn you over to Michael Dellis from Fastener Tool and Supply and let him share with you how their company is utilizing technology. Thank you, Kim. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Michael Dellis with Fastener Tool and Supply. We're over here in Solon, Ohio, um, actually in Glen Willow technically, but we use the Solon uh, address. In fact, uh, our neighbors behind us, Amazon, 550,000 square foot facility and Probably right about now in five minutes, there's going to be a hundred vans leaving that warehouse, uh, taking all of your products out to you guys. So um, it, it's interesting, you know, we talk about these things and some of the things Carol, uh, Cheryl and um, Kim brought up during the uh, during the past uh, two presentations here. 
really hits home into, into my life cycle here with Bastion Tool and Supply. I've been with our company since 2008. We've kind of lived through um, this journey into Industry 4.0. So we'll get started on the next slide, Phyllis. And you could forward right to the next one as well. So Industry 4.0, and I think it really starts with some questions. And um, we had a business transaction. Our ownership changed in 2008. That's when I was brought on board. And we kind of looked at each other and said, well, where do we go from here? Um, and it's really asking yourselves, how do, we, how do we take it to the next level? We were a very successful company in 2008. Um, we had a lot of great things going for us, but we weren't progressing. We were in a, in a stagnant growth mode. Um, we had about 65 employees at the time. And we, you know, we weren't growing. The, the owners were happy with where things were. And our new ownership came in and said, we need to advance. We need to look at our customer base and our workforce and see how we can make it to that next level. So I, I think that was really the start of our journey to industry 4.0 um, before it really was a buzzword and, and you know came into the forefront of discussion. So we looked at ourselves and said, who are we at our core and where are we at today? Who's our competition? Who are our customers and what do they need to grow and, and what's our plan to move forward? So let's take a look at the next slide and answer some of these questions. We are Fastener Tool and Supply. We're a certified small business established in 1977. Um, like I said, the ownership changed in 2008. Today, we're only at about 45 employees. So that's a 30% reduction in our workforce since 2008. Um, that's a lot of jobs that have changed. Through this time, we, we migrated to a new ERP system in 2015. Um, we've implemented a CRM system. We built a brand new facility here in Glenwell at 68,000 square feet. We became a lot more efficient in things that we were doing. And as people retired, um, we didn't replace those positions and we reallocated resources where it was needed. So, you know, 30% reduction in workforce since that time, I think the highest in the last couple of years. Uh, we had a record year in 2018, we're up to 50 employees, but we've had some, some turnover and haven't replaced some of those positions. And it's been good. We've been doing um, more with less. We've got 2,100 suppliers across the world and 1,600 customers as well. We've got 45 implant customer warehouses or vendor managed inventory programs. We break our customers down into three different segments. We have our high performance customers, people who need um, a lot of make to print special engineered items, commercial and industrial and aerospace and defense. So we are a distributor. We are not a manufacturer. We partner with our manufacturing base across the globe, um, but we do, we're a value added distributor for the manufacturers, hopefully listening to this, this presentation um, and, and the big OEMs in not only uh, the Midwest here, but across the United States. Next slide, please. And what we really had to do was build our core competency, look inside. And I think that was a really tough question for our team. Um, actually, some of our customers had challenged us with it over time. And, and you're sitting in front of a, a group of prospective buyers or current customers, and they look at you and they say, well, what's your core competency? And um, it, it's not as easy. If you, if you ask yourself that question, what is your core competency? Where are you at today? Has it changed? Where are you going in the future? And it really took um, a, a three-step approach for us to figure that out, to say, you know, we're a value-added distributor of high-performance products, services, supply chain solutions for our OEM customers, but what is our strategic direction? You know, where do we want to be today? Where do we want to be in five years, 10 years from now? Um, what is our focus? And I think one of the big things we focused on in the last 13 years um, through our journey here is to continue to improve the customer experience, utilizing innovation and change. Um, we remove a lot of complexity from things that our customers are doing. We look for that low-hanging fruit, and then we continue to dig and dig and dig until we provide them a value that is unique to their own operation. I don't think there's a solution that fits um, everybody's needs, and I think uh, that's part of our goal is really understanding that customer experience through innovation and change. And our goal here is to allow our core competency to evolve. And I think if we stuck to what the core was back in 2008, we would not be here today. Um, I think the lot, of, you know, COVID would have probably wiped this out. We wouldn't have been able to mobilize and, and go remote with a, much of our workforce. Our shop floor and our quality and engineering teams are still here every day, but we were able to mobilize our um, 
our purchasing supply chain and our sales staff. Uh, we went remote and we've been able to service our customers that way. We've in, um, integrated a lot of technology into our services and we've evolved in our core competency to make sure that we continue to meet the needs of our, our ever-growing customer base. Next slide, please. So who are our competitors? Um, I'm gonna say that the majority of our competitors, if I did a, a chart, I would say the pie chart is highly represented by Mon Pa small distributors. There's a ton of them here in Ohio. Um, we run into them all over the place with our customers and, and you know, seeing how our industry has grown up and who doesn't have succession plans and who hasn't taken it to the next level. I think that that small distributor model, that Mon Pa, there's still companies that compete with us who don't have an ERP system. They're managing their business on QuickBooks. They're not looking at computer-aided technology to do predictive forecasting. Um, they've said that it hasn't, this has worked for years and years and years, and we're not changing. And if you don't you know, want to use us, then go ahead and, and try and live without us. And I think that that approach has uh, opened up the doors for Fastener Tool and Supply in, in, in our growth organically both with our current customer base and new prospective customers over the years. So we would consider ourselves small to mid-side distributor. And then um, the large distributors, the Fastenals of the world, the Grangers, MSC on the commercial side, and then on the aerospace side, Wesco, um, Incora now is their name. Uh, some of those companies keep buying small distributors and they keep growing. And uh, we fit kind of in the middle there. We have enough energy to give all of our customers the customer service that they need. Nobody's too small, nobody's too big. They, they get the same team. We have low turnover in our staff and uh, we, fit, we fit a really good model for the needs of our customers. So that's kind of the landscape that we live in today. Next slide, please. And I failed to mention on that, on that last slide, you don't need to go back, but those nuts and bolts have not changed over the last 50 to 75 years. The nuts and bolts, the washers, um, materials have improved, uh, standards have improved, plating specs and coatings have changed, but at the, at the core, our business really hasn't changed. And it's the inability to evolve and see that those customers that we're servicing today expect that change. Um, our customers, where are their products going? They're going into these global markets of aerospace, agriculture, automotive, consumer goods, power generation, military defense, construction and mining. They're, they need to grow. You guys need to grow as, as OEMs, and assemblers and manufacturers. And, and the end use of these products really are high performance applications in most, in most, you know, most situations, even the furniture industry, um, looking at the Pollywood versus, you know, Amish built uh, furniture, and we have customers that demand high performance fasteners in their furniture, and we're on you know jet engine airplane um, platforms as well. So there's there's a lot of need for growth and a lot of need for change. So where does that take us um, to the next slide? Understanding our value proposition. So how do the large distributors, um, the Ma and Pa, and our competitors in the small to mid sized markets? How do they create a value proposition for our customers? And what we did was we look inside and say, what does our value map look like? What are our gain creators and our pain relievers to the issues that our customers have doing their day-to-day -day jobs? Um, how much hands-on involvement do those customers need to manage a, a C item like a, a, like a fastener? Um, usually the lowest spend in their supply chain, but it does hold everything together um, figuratively and, and you know, in real time, it, it it's a need, and our customers don't want to mess with placing POs and managing stock and um, moving parts from one pl place to the next. So really understanding the value map, what our services and our technology can provide our customers to help them do their jobs better. So we ask ourselves, are we prepared to grow? Are we prepared to help our customers grow? Is there a good fit? Are we evolving with their changes? Are we waiting for them to ask us to do more, or are we coming out and providing new, new solutions? And I think if you're on the, on the other end of that, you're, you're coming up with new ideas for these customers to say, hey, I think you could do your job better if you allow us to do X, Y, and Z. That's where that value proposition falls into place. And we've been very successful over the past 
um, 10 plus years in, in doing that. Next slide, please. So I think the big thing is to really sit down and look in the mirror and you have to measure yourself. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done up front. You can't go direct from uh, an idea right to a solution as, as many of our customers want us to do. There is a process for that. You need to listen to what our customers need. And, and we've done that. We've sit there. And like I said before, not there's no two solutions that's going to work um, exactly the same for everybody across the board. So it's really listening, coming up with the plan, and then committing to that solution. Um, the transition is a process. I think you have to have the right culture. And one of the things our owners were able to do for us is allow us to do some key resource planning, put people in the right seats in our organization to make good decisions, and give us the latitude to make change, bring in technology, bring in um, improvements. You know, when, we, when I started here, we did a lot of manual labor, um, you know, secondary rework and secondary operations within our facility where we could use machine um, technology to help reduce the need. And instead of one operator doing one job, I have an operator doing four jobs. Um, we've invested in customer applications where we're mimicking what they're doing on their floor putting the hardware through a process and making sure that when it hits that customer's door, that it is shipped to stock, ready to go, it's on their floor and it can go right into their application, into their robotic, their, their collaborative robots or some of the other robotic assembly processes that they have. Um, the last thing you wanna do is receive a call from your, from your customer saying, your parts jammed up my robot again. We've got four hours of downtime, we need to take everything apart. Um, we've invested in customer technology here, we've invested in material handling, um, non-contact dimensional equipment that we can do um, high-end inspections with. We've invested in alloy analyzers. We've invested in load cell uh, testers. We've invested in bulk handling equipment um, that can do things more ergonomic and safe for our staff here. So we've been able to do a lot more with the staff that we have by making sure that we have the right strategic direction, we have the culture here who's going to embrace that type of change. In addition, embracing, embracing technology and big data, um, everybody has a forecast, whether they're good or not, that's still something that's part of our job. Everybody has a, uh, has a scorecard as well. Taking all of this data, we have supplier data, um, 2,100 suppliers we're managing for 1,600 customers, and that supply base is growing as there's supplier consolidation in our market taking all these pieces of data and really understanding what do we do with it. Um, we hired a, a team of, of a couple people here whose sole job is using that information and creating SharePoint and Microsoft Flow projects to incorporate business processes that used to be manual paperwork type of things and streamlining our own internal process for our AES 9100 system. We've also implemented automated reporting using Power BI. Reports that customers used to ask for on a weekly basis regarding inventory or scheduling or any other kind of planning, that stuff automatically goes out to our customers without anybody's finger on that button to hit send. Um, that's something that they want to keep them a, a, you know, aware of what's going on with our inventory, and it really prevents a lot of stockouts. We have a SharePoint report that we utilize on a daily basis. It refreshes every 15 minutes. That's our backlog. Everybody in the act in the company has access to it. And it's a way that we've been able to maintain a 99 plus percent delivery on time rating over the past five years and running since we went live with our new ERP system. Digitizing all of our certifications, anything inbound, um, we're essentially paperless, minus the fact that a lot of our customers have very specific packaging needs. So we still use paper for um, that final step to make sure that all of those ducks are in a row before it goes out. But really paying attention to cybersecurity, we partnered, we're only, we only have 46 people here, we don't have an IT group. So we've partnered with strategic key resources to do the things that, you know, so we could focus on our core competency. So cybersecurity and helping us utilize all of the um, internet of things together with big data to make sure that we have the right processes here the safety, the security that make our customers comfortable doing business with us. We've utilized a lot of technology tools over the past few years. We invested in technology called digital bins, which we'll see in a couple slides here, that um, 
is a, is a proactive versus a reactive way of managing inventory. We've invested in cloud-based solutions and mobile platforms. So really, you know, our owners didn't even know we were moving towards this industry 4.0, but we knew that our customers demanded it. Um, yes, there's a label on it with industry 4.0 or factory of the future, but it really was the embrace that we had from that day one in 2008 to really move forward. And we couldn't be where we're at without that commitment from the top down. Next slide, please. So our customers demand high performance. Um, I talked about our on-time delivery rating and our quality ratings. Our business model system or our quality management system AS9100 or ISO 9001 were dual certified. It involves a lot of risk management. And it really goes back to doing the work up front, um, not making changes unless there's a process for that. Uh, I think on a few slides way at the beginning, we talked a lot about tacit knowledge and um, that, that tribal knowledge that lives in operators' heads. And we've done a really good job over the last five years um, with our ERP migration to whatever we thought was, hey, X, Y, Z, John only knows this, or Denise only knows this, we put together a process to take that tacit knowledge, put it into a work instruction, or put it into a business process, and move this thing forward. So on the right-hand side, our, our ERP system we call TBE. Um, the CRM system, we're using HubSpot for a lot of our marketing and our CRM. Power BI is a huge part to help with the big data and the internet of things and then the technology-aided solution. And all that does is provide us customer value because we're able to put a predictive forecast. We're able to predict when a customer is going to be out of parts rather than reacting to it. Um, we have plenty of, of supply in, in, in our facility here or committed to our supply chain. So we're really trying to stay a step ahead of our customers. And having these tools has allowed us to maintain a high delivery and uh, quality performance rating. So the next slide, we'll talk about a case study from a, a very recent, it's actually in process right now, Fortune 500 company. Um, something that all of this kind of led up to in the process that we put in place. So I'll talk about the current state. There's four plants of this division in three different states. There's four different buying groups. They had four different vendor managed inventory programs. They're using a perpetual inventory model. The sales reps were there twice a day, five days a week. You know, they say Fastenal is there five days a week. And, and our team looks at it and goes, that's great. And, and it's a security blanket for a lot of manufacturers and assemblers. But we look at it and say, then that's a mismanagement of the inventory if they need to be there every single day, because you're paying, you're paying labor for that. Um, there's obviously a cost to having someone there every day. So it's a lot of labor um, twice a day, five days a week. Everything was reactive. So that salesperson goes in, they look at a thousand bin locations, and what does their order come back to? Maybe 50 to 100 items that they have to look, and then they repeat that the next day. So every day they're looking at um, a reactive way of replenishing orders, which is a chance for lying down. There's um, a lot of spikes. Customers will look at a 12 month usage, divide by 12, and say, that's my monthly usage. Well, if, if you have two big jobs that consume all that inventory within three months, uh, you have to be able to predict that stuff. And a lot of the big data that comes down is to prevent you from having those, those lying down situations. Customer had a ton of safety stock in, in, on their floor, and the buyer planner interaction involved every single transaction, not to mention receiving, accounting, everything that takes place to get that, that item paid for. So what does the future state look, look like? It was a big paradigm shift for this company, but the four plants in three states are going to Re, um, rely on one buying group. There's going to be one VMI model looking forward with one solution. We're going from perpetual inventory to consignment expensed inventory, which is a huge change. Um, they're basically removing everything off of their bill of materials and saying it better be there when I need it. And our, our model, um, which was live in one of these plants, has shown over the past five years that they've not had a line down in five years. Uh, we're not holding excessive amounts of inventory, but it's a predictive model that is proactive in its replenishment. There's gonna be extremely low safety stock because of the consignment. We're able to reallocate that sales rep's time for the growth and building relationships with that customer, taking that into different divisions. And it's completely autonomous from a piece count accuracy perspective. So at every second of the day, this technology is counting products so that the customer doesn't have to manage. So the next slide, we're gonna go through a quick one minute and 30 second uh, video. 
At Fastener Tool & Supply, we are committed to delivering outstanding value by offering the highest quality products, integrated technology, and supply chain management solutions. Consolidating your supply chain with products and services from Fastener Tool & Supply provides you with the most efficient, seamless, cost-effective solution available. Our trusted quality and dependability allow you to save time, improve customer satisfaction, and grow profitability. We stock inventory specific to your needs, investing in your future success. Our Vendor Managed Inventory, or VMI, programs are rooted in technology that is custom fit for your operation, enabling you to streamline processes, mitigate risk, and improve performance. Inventory outages are a thing of the past when you integrate our cutting-edge Digital Bins platform into your operation. Digital Bins is a proactive inventory management system that provides the user with full inventory transparency and automates component replenishment. Digital Bins provides modern, visual factory tools to error-proof your picking and receiving process. The foundation below the surface of our programs is a robust collection of real-time reports that ensure your Kanban signals, triggers, and safety stock are dynamic and able to adjust to your forecasts and demand. We've embraced our strong core values of respect, integrity, customer focus, innovation, and excellence to give our clients high-performance, value-added solutions they can rely on time and time again. Contact us today for a demo of our Digital Bins technology. To learn more, visit us at FasteneTool.com. All right, thank you for that. Um, that does a better explanation of you know, the pictures here. Uh, I know we're running short on time. I think I've already hit the 2.30 mark. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it with that. Digital Bins has been the solution for this customer. We've got um, 10 live customer installs right now across, uh, across the Midwest here, and we're looking to expand that. So that was kind of the, the cap of the, our journey to Industry 4.0, and I'll turn it back over to uh, whoever's closing this meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want to thank everybody for their time today. I know this was kind of a longer session, but we had a lot that we wanted to talk about. I want to thank Michael from Fastener Tool and Supply for their presentation on how they're using technology in the digital bin. I also want to thank Jacob and Team Neo for all the information they provided um, through the survey and their involvement in today's webinar. And just a reminder, again, a PDF of all the slides um, is in your control panel on the right. And this webinar is going to be available on our website uh, starting tomorrow at www.hwco.com slash webinars. And with that, thank you again for everybody's time. And, uh, you know, please sign up for our mailings. Make sure, you know, make sure you're on our list. And the next time we have a, a webinar that's manufacturing based, we'll make sure to invite you. Everybody take care.